I want to welcome to the program a really interesting guy uh, whose background I'm, I'm really interested in hearing about, but he happens to be a congressional candidate in a very winnable seat here in Virginia. Hung Kao, welcome to the program. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Holmes. This is, uh, listen, thank you for coming in studio. You're up here, you're, I suppose you're taking meetings and everybody's telling you how you're going to win? Exactly. You know, if I had a book I could write, it'd be, everybody's a freaking consultant, right? Everybody has their, their <laughs> own thing. And you're like, okay, thanks. Thank you so much. But if <laughs> if your record is less than one win, then, uh, you know, I don't want your... Then you, then you don't want yeah. to hear from them. Well, I think that's a good rule of thumb. Unfortunately, there's a lot of candidates who don't have that rule of thumb. Exactly. Uh, but it's good to see. Listen, you got a lot of momentum. I want to get into your background and everything uh, shortly. Let's talk about the race. You got in. How's it going? Oh, it's going great. I mean, we we want, we came in late in the game. We came in uh, at the end of January, and in four months, we were able to win a pretty large field, right? 11 ca- amazing candidates. We won with 53%, and then now the momentum's just picking up. And just last weekend, uh, when we were at the uh, 4th of July celebration, I just couldn't believe the outpouring of, uh, of support. I mean, people were chanting USA as I was walking by, so it's, it was great. Oh, that's great. So they know your background. Let's inform everybody else in the Ruthless Variety program audience. Your captain, special operations. Let's get the full. Let's get the full map of, of your background. Well, yeah, I had the normal childhood. Born in Vietnam, raised in Africa. <laughs> yeah. Summers in France. <laughs> no, uh, no, I I, um, I was born in Vietnam, and and you know, in 1975, my family fled Vietnam, and so it was a scary time. My parents had to make hard decisions, and um, my mom was sewing notes in our clothes with uh, money, saying, "Hey, does my son please take care of him in case we get separated?" Wild. And, and even at one point, they had to make the hard decision, what if we can't bring all five of the kids? What if the Americans will only take two or three? Who do we leave behind? And that's the reality of war, you know? And, and we came here, we came here with nothing. Literally, we came with two suitcases. Some jerk stole one of them. Oh, so man. we had one suitcase of just memories. My mom packed uh, pictures and things to remember what, what life was. We didn't bring money or anything like that. And uh, this country gave us this amazing opportunity. It gives you this ladder opportunity, but you still have to climb up yourself. And so my dad, uh, he was the deputy minister of agriculture in Vietnam. Um, he was actually schooled in, at Cornell. And, you know, his friends were saying, hey, if you want to be a farmer, you can stay here. But, you know, there's really no future over here unless you want to go to Africa. So we spent the next seven years in West Africa. So I, I went to French schools in Africa for, uh, from the age of five until 12. And then, again, my parents had to make another hard decision. What? You know, these kids don't speak any English. So my mom had to bring us back here. My dad stayed in Africa for another 15 years wow. to work, to, to support the family, seeing us every six months. And I came over here and, you know, grew up here, went to Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology, the first class to ever graduate from there. <laughs> and I went to uh, the Naval Academy. I got my master's in physics from Naval Postgraduate School. I went to Harvard. I went to MIT. But you still have to pay back, right? I mean, you owe this country everything. So that I paid back with, with um, you know, almost 30 years of uh, service in, in the military. And I fought in Iraq, Afghanistan, Somalia. I went to Pakistan. I went to um, the Balkans. And, uh, you know, I dove the ocean depths. I recovered bodies from the bottom of the ocean. I did whatever this country gave us. Oh, man. Listen, I, let's go back to the, the growing up. So you're in this country with your mom and your siblings? Yes, my four older sisters. Yes. Four older sisters. And, and your dad's still in West Africa trying to provide, yes. basically, at that point. You see him every six months. Got to imagine that has a formative impact on a young man. Yeah, I mean, but that's sacrifice, right? I mean, the exactly. sacrifice our parents make uh, for for us. Yeah, right. And so, when he does, he he finally comes back fifteen years later. You're how you're how old at that point? At that point, I was, um, you know, I was well out of college. And um, so, were you already in the military? I was. At that I point? was. A, yeah, I just graduated from Naval Academy, and then went to. Uh, then I was serving uh, on board the um, one of the ships, the, the USS Grasp. Um, you know. I was a diver on that ship, and then later on, uh, the uh, explosive ordnance disposal. And what, what year are we talking about here? Um, this is nineteen ninety eight, okay, or so. Yes. Yeah. So, all right. So you're in it, and 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 then through your your military career, obviously, you rise through the ranks. You end up, like you said, in battle zone after battle zone. Tell us about that. You know. Um, you know, war is an ugly thing, but it's really not the ugliest of things. You know, you see, you see hardships. You see, you know, people struggling all the time. Uh, I mean, they just want freedom. You know, and and that's where again one of the reasons why I want to go in Congress because, 
you know, we can't use our military as just a pawn in the game. You send them over there to do things, and that's it. They leave. And in fact, the whole idea of the military being a nation builder is wrong. Right. We're not nation builders. We're nation destroyers. That's the State Department's job. And, and I think that they, they don't exercise all— It's been all conflated a bit over the years. Exactly. Yeah, we're not there to, to build up their police force or, or their infrastructure. That's the State Department's job. And so I think that people need to understand what the military is used for. It's a blunt instrument. So, so, uh, where all have you gone? Gosh, uh, I mean, Africa. I've spent a lot of time in Africa, both you know, growing up and and in my military career. You know, um, the um, Tunisia, Somalia, Algeria. Um, wild. S- um, gosh, where else? Um, a lot of dangerous Morocco. places. Yes, and then uh, all of Europe, uh, and then uh, in, into the Black Sea, as well as um, Iraq, Afghanistan. Pakistan. I was there for the uh, earthquake relief, uh, and then you know, I mean, we we turns out we were about a stone's throw away from where Osama bin Laden was. Huh. We just didn't know it, and then um, no, we just all over the Middle East, and then uh, some parts of Asia too. So, in what capacities were you were you uh, over there? Like in, when you were in these war zones? I mean, what what were you doing? Um, Explosive ordnance disposal, but really, I mean, special operations. I mean, I supported uh, SEAL teams and and, um, yeah. and special forces teams. And then one time I was also over there with the Riverines, so the, the gunboat, uh, you know, the, like the swift boats remember, yeah. from Vietnam, all those are still in existence uh, at the time. And we used those in Basra to uh, up the Tigris and the um, Euphrates rivers and uh, patrolling around there, uh, really going against sometimes the Iranians because a lot of times they, the uh, insurgents will launch rockets at us and then run across the border. So we'd have to try to mow them down before they, they went across the border. Uh, and, uh, you know, then the Iranian gunboats would come up and bump up against us. And yeah, we, had, we didn't surrender. Been. We didn't yeah. surrender like that other guy with the white socks. Right, right. There no. was no white flags on yeah, your exactly, boat. Exactly. Not on captain's boat. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Well, so, all right. So you, th- that experience, and how long were you in the Navy? Uh, well, I always give the Naval Academy sign, which is all me bloomy life. My mother was oh. a mermaid <laughs> and my father was King Neptune. I was born on the crest of a wave and rocked in the cradle deep. No, I was, um, I, I, uh, I came in the Navy enlisted in 1989. Then I went to Naval Academy. And then, um, I, so commission wise, I had 25 years of commission service. Uh, mm-hmm. so from 1996 till 2021. That's amazing. That's incredible. And so now you decided you're going to take all that service to your, to your country. And now you're going to run for Congress. I mean, you got a real service-minded attitude here. Thank you. No, well, I was really thinking about, you know, just kicking back and drinking Mai Tais and, and enjoying <laughs> the kids. I mean, I have five kids. and um, You don't seem like a Mai Tai drinking no. guy. It kicks back, though, I'll be honest with you. Well, it's just I really want to do something else. I wanted to run a, a 501c3, something to help our wounded warriors. But just watching those mothers hand babies to to Marines in Afghanistan. I mean, just six months after is I that, just Is left. that what the trigger was for you? Right. It was just, the Afghanistan, the yeah. disaster, the, the pullout of troops? It was an absolute disaster. You're right. Because we, General Miller, uh, uh, Scotty Miller, had a plan to leave 2,500 people over there to as a stabilization force. Yeah. Not, not not to do anything. We just, if the Taliban acted up, we'd just go strike and come back to our, our FOB. But um, the president... The current president didn't do anything. He didn't approve. He didn't disapprove. He just sat there and just, you know, kind of pocket veto and didn't do anything. And then we had to pull out. And made a political decision. Yes. Right? I mean, it was a decision to get out of Afghanistan based entirely on a calendar here on to be out by September 11th. Nothing to do with conditions on the ground nope. or support forces or... Or even a strategy. I mean, they gave up Bagram before they... <laughs> yeah, the Bagram was never supposed to be given up. That was uh, something, a decision made by... You know, guys at the State Department wearing skinny jeans and man buns. That was, uh, <laughs> I that was, love that. That's uh, that was never a plan that we we had. That Bagram was supposed to be the the launch base for any kind of counter strike. I mean, what the hell were they thinking? They weren't. They were just. They came up and just told the guys, "Well, the Taliban would really like to have." Like, I don't care what the Taliban would really like to have. Right. You know? Yeah. No. No. We're, we're, we're. I thought we were out of that business in two thousand one. Exactly. Caring what the Taliban exactly thought about. Yes. Yeah, well, so, all right, so I can understand a, a man who put the kind of service to his country in that you have would watch that and think, I got to get involved again. Absolutely. Um, you know, um, right now we have the lowest amount of veterans in Congress and Senate of the 535 seats. We're going to change that this year, though. Yes, there's only 89, 89 people who've served and worn the cloth of this nation. And they don't understand sacrifice, right? I mean, in Australia, they put the war memorial right across the street from the parliament so that members of the parliament 
see what the cost of war is every day when they leave office. Mm-hmm. You know, these guys, it's just a punchline for them. So you get out. Actually, I heard a funny story about this. Before we get into your run and, and all the decisions that are, are made to go about doing that and how it's all going, I heard a funny story that you were involved in sort of the salvage of the JFK Jr. plane. Was this true? Yes, it is. What is the story? So I, I've heard like pieces of this, but I've never gotten the full thing. Okay. Uh, okay. First of all, I, I know what you think. Is this, is this like Geraldo Rivera opening up the vault, right? And it, was he really down there? Yes, he was. So, oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. For our QAnon listeners, we can, we can, we can cast no doubt about what's happening. Here. No, it was, it was really John F. Kennedy Jr.'s body. So he, um, uh, in 1999, he crashed uh, off of Martha's Vineyard and, um, you know, everybody was out there searching and, it was funny because that night we had an officer's party at my commanding officer's house and we were all, you know, all the men were gathered around the, the charts of uh, Martha, Martha's Vineyard Sound because we knew we were going to get called up. And next morning, sure enough, they said, get underway right now and, and go salvage uh, uh, the plane and go look for the plane. And so I was the operations officer of ship and there was like 15 other entities up there uh, searching. So I, my job was to, to basically make the grid map and, and, and coordinate the entire search because, you know, we were the senior officer afloat. And so we took command of all the ships. We went around and, and, and searched and, and found it within within 24 hours of being on station. We found it. That's and wild, right? Because, I mean, at that point, there was just some kind of loose radar contact when that plane, it was a small private plane. Yes. He and his fiance or wife, Carolyn. It's his wife, his wife and his sister-in-law, yeah. Right, right. We're, we're in it and, and sort of vanished. And exactly. then it's your job to go out and try to find this plane. Yes. It's like finding a needle in a haystack. And so, you know, I, I, we, you know, three days of no, non, no sleeping. I mean, because I, mean, I was the operations officer, I ran the entire operations, uh, you know, from, from getting us underway to getting up there, getting all the ships together and saying, okay, we're taking t- op- operational control of this mission. You go here, you go here. And I was, you know... I ran the whole mission, and then, then they came up. And, uh, you know, after we found the the plane uh, located that night, they came up and they said, "Hey, ops, you have to suit up." I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> I said, like, "Well, you're the last clean diver because the way we dive, we do surface decompression. You go down. Oh yeah. And then at uh, when you come up to about thirty feet, they take you up and over, and then they drop. Uh, then they strip you completely, throw you in a recompression chamber, take you down to forty feet, and, and recompress you in the chamber." So, so when you, don't you get do the that, bends and all that, yeah. Right? So when you do that, you can't dive for 24 hours. So every diver on board was dirty, what we call dirty. They they couldn't They'd dive. Already for done it, yeah. So they're like, "Sir, you got to dive." I'm like, "You got to be kidding me!" There's surely there's somebody else on <laughs> board that can dive. I thought I was me. running this joy. Yeah, but not only that, I hadn't slept in three days. Yeah. Oh man. And so I'm like, okay, this is you know on a safety miss. I can just see this on a safety mishap, right? But I was like, all right, fine, I'll go down. And, and sure enough, the plane was there. It was. Uh, I mean, it's a Piper 32, and it, it had been crushed up like a. Uh, a soda can honestly because really? he hit at 200 knots um, you know he wasn't instrument qualified so he what first thing apparently you learn is to trust your instruments instead of your, your yeah. sights and so he lost sight and bearing of, of the horizon and went straight into the ocean at uh, 200 knots Oof. and so the, the plane was crushed up like a um, you know as a um, like a soda can soda said. can yeah, yeah. and so you know, it's, it was just sad. It was just sad because he was very iconic and, and, you know, you see him on TV and he seemed like a nice guy. Yeah. And That's got to be a wild feeling though. Then you're down at the plane and, and yeah. you've got a, you got a really, really grim task at that point. Right. And then, um, so we brought that plane, plane and the bodies up and then Ted Kennedy came aboard and, uh, gosh, you ever see Tommy boy where, where he, he inflates the, uh, the, the, uh, life preserver and it just <laughs> yeah. pops. that's what he looked like wearing a k-pock you know it looks like a literally it looks like a big pumpkin on a on a toothpick but no no but honestly at that time it was a, a man who you know a man a family who was hurting and and it didn't matter what side they were on they were they were just suffering americans and we wanted to bring closure to the family and, and so it was an honor to to bring back the remains in the plane that's an um, incredible story yeah. so I, I, absolutely amazing and on the front page of every newspaper in the english-speaking world at that point so i mean you were you were front and center on that. Yeah, uh, we, we were. I mean, it's it's the whole team, right? It's not just one person. It's not two. It's, it's an entire ship, and, and also the whole flotilla that was under our control to that found and searched uh, for for the plane. But it was like I said, they were suffering Americans, and we want to bring closure to them and, and just bring some peace to them. Yeah. All right. So let's get back to your your after Afghanistan. Clearly, that enrages you. You want to do something about it. How quickly do you start thinking about running for Congress? 
Well, I thought about it in, when I retired in October, and my wife said no. <laughs> I was yeah. like, okay. She has 51% of the votes, so I'm like, <laughs> yeah. yes, ma'am. Good husband there. But uh, in January, I think, when, when our friends were getting kicked out of the military for not getting the vaccine, uh, that's when oh, that wow. really got her going. She said, look, I know you're the person to do this because you always get things done, so you need to run. And are, so, your fo- are your folks still around? So my father just passed away five months ago. Oh, I'm sorry um, to hear that. And um, he, he, he had a great life, honestly. Five kids and... Uh, 14 grandchildren all of his kids went to college we're all we all has have uh, advanced degrees i mean uh, if you want to talk about what you can accomplish in a life it doesn't get much better than that right i mean he he has this i mean we can go on forever about my father because he at the age of 13 he was his father was taken away by the the Viet Cong, and so he was the man of the house because his older brother was killed uh running ammunition for the french foreign legion up up down uh, up and down the uh the Laotian border he was, and so he you got some he, heroism in your blood man That's and so unbelievable he, so he he had to take care of his family and so he 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 became like a cleaning boy for the french foreign legion and the the, the captain in charge of the french foreign french foreign legion who was used to be a nazi of all, of all things um after world war ii they didn't have anything to do so they joined the french foreign legion took a liking to him because he was such a hard worker and gave him extra work and he was able to to buy a new house for his family and and put his younger brother, uh, younger brother, two brothers and sister to school sacrificing, you know, he never, he had to drop out of school and, but he still taught himself through, through their books. And he ended up earning a scholarship to the university of Philippines for his bachelor's and then Cornell for his master's and PhD work. Yeah. Well, he certainly instilled a service in his kids. There's no question about that. It's a tremendously impressive story. So now you're running for Congress and You probably, I mean, look, this is a far cry from what you were doing as a captain in the Navy. I mean, this is a different deal, right? You're, you're encountering voters for the first time in your life, but people who probably have very similar frustrations to you, maybe not with the specificity in, in the military background, but this country's a mess, right? I got got to imagine that you're finding a lot of resonance out there. Absolutely. I mean, the oath of office for a military officer is the same as as an elected official, which is, I, you know, I solemnly swear to support and defend the Constitution of the United States, right, against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And that oath is not just to the Constitution, right? It's not to a king. It's not to a president. It's to the Constitution. It's to we, the people. And I think that's what Congress has forgotten or, or the government, right? Joe Biden's forgotten that. He serves we, the people. Mm-hmm. That's who he answers to. That's who I answer to. And as a commanding officer out there, you know, I served my men and women, right? I, I served them. I, I was their commanding officer. I was their voice, and I took care of them so they can do the job and they can do the mission. Mm-hmm. And so I see this the same thing. I'm serving them in a different capacity, but I'm going to take care of them. I'm going to look out for their best interests. I'm going to support and defend the Constitution. I'm going to protect that Constitution. Because, you know, a lot of people don't understand what it's like to wake up one day and not have a flag to stand under or a country called their own. There you go. That's exactly right. And that's a perspective that uniquely we hear from a lot of people running this cycle, right? We've got a lot of a lot of people not exactly with your specific background, but with a sort of a non-traditional Republican. When you think about a Republican, they don't always think about people like you. And what we're finding in this particular time period is that we're everywhere. Exactly. (laughs) Right. And it's now, but it's now the people who have this sort of sense of service that they can't wait anymore. You got to go get involved, which is what you've done. Exactly. And, and, you know, I'm not going to do forever. I mean, I do my time, tap out, go somewhere else, someone else does it, but I've got, we've got to stabilize this economy. We've got to secure this country, protect this country, both at the border and from enemies abroad, including China. And, you know, and then education. I mean, for for the forty five percent minorities in my district, you know, we all and twenty five percent of which are immigrants. We came here for the same thing. We came here for for freedom, education for our kids, and and really for family values. And the left is destroying that. And so the education. What my parents taught me was, look, they, they're, any day you can lose your wealth, you can lose your position in life, but you can never lose. The, the knowledge in your head and that's why education was so big and when the left does things like destroy Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology by by changing the entrance criteria 
that's that's this a destruction and that's if anything that's that's a, a racist thing for right. you know for the people who keep calling us racist i mean that's the most racist thing there is yeah it's amazing how that works right yes. it, it, they, they, their projection particularly on racism has gotten really incredible these days absolutely yeah i mean you see it in schools in particular <laughs> and they're right? gonna call me like um was it what's a new uh, white adjacent or something like that like, <laughs> in fact i went to home Wait, are depot you serious? yeah th- th- i'm not i'm not a minority i'm a white adjacent i, I actually went to home depot and look at the uh, the shells and the i think i'm more off-white or <laughs> or eggshell eggshell color i think i think that's what they want to call me so they're calling you white adjacent yes the, so yeah we're we're, we're not this minorities. is awesome yeah they, so well, they you gotta up, laugh at that shit, right because right? it's, it's so bad that, that you have to make up terms for this i mean <laughs> Because I don't meet your mantra, you have to, you have to pigeonhole me somehow. Like, why can't you just call me an American? Because that's, that's the I, thing or, I don't understand. I mean, basically, but you know what? They answer that question too because they don't think America is all that great to begin with, right? God, they've got to make up some sort of narrative about what it is our motives, right? Exactly. Or or, or, or white adjacent, which yeah. is just like the most eggshell. I prefer eggshell. <laughs> Gosh, that's good. So I assume you're having some fun on the campaign trail. It's awesome. It's awesome meeting just just the voters out there. I mean, I'm, I'm you know, as you can, you can see, I'm very introverted and I'm a wallflower. So you know, no, <laughs> yeah, I, I really love I you love like being a out quiet there. guy. <laughs> yeah, I love being out there with uh, with the voters and, and just listening to what they have to say. Yeah, you know, I want to hear what they have to say. And, and you know, a lot of times, what I tell the men and women under my charge was like, don't give me a problem without a solution. Some people have amazing solutions. They're, they've got some really great ideas and and how to make this country better. And, and I'm just their voice sometimes. Mm-hmm. Well, listen, Hung, you're doing a hell of a job because you're getting dangerously close to becoming a congressman here. Thank you. I mean, well, Joe Biden's helped me every day, so thanks, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, and you brought us you brought us some Jefferson's Ocean, which I got to imagine there's a naval piece to this. Yes. So you know, I'm a sailor, so I figured. I, I brought you uh, bourbon from uh, you know Tennessee, you know made in Tennessee, but then aged at sea, so that you know as it's crossing the equator, uh, you know up and down the equator, the the barrels like contract and expand, and and so it's aged at sea. Um, but you know, as a sailor, I, I just wanted something nautical for you. And uh, you know, there's a lot of terms that came came from Navy. I think I, I told you, like um, you probably um, didn't touch his stuff in the Navy, though, right, Hong? No, of it's course just, not. It's the- <laughs> no, so you know, nobody <laughs> does in the Navy. Of probably. course not. No. In <laughs> fact, you know, the term um, um, a cup of Joe comes from the Navy, right? Because uh, when they outlawed alcohol on board ships, it was under uh, the Secretary of Navy uh, Josephus Daniels. So the strongest thing they ever had was a cup of coffee. So they that's why they call it Cup of Joe, because <laughs> for Josephus Daniels. Listen, we're learning all kinds of things here. Today. Yeah, this it's, is I've got, I'm full of uh, useless facts. You know, like, <laughs> it's like the Cliff Clavin of the Navy. Yeah, exactly. I love it. Oh, it's awesome. Well, all right, Normie. <laughs> yeah, right, seriously. So listen, you got to get this over the finish line. Uh, I have three questions for you, but before we get to that, where can our people help you out? Um, okay, don't go on hotasiandews.com because it's just, <laughs> that's not safe. No, just kidding. <laughs> No, um, that's it's, it, that's it. A, a uh, an OnlyFans account that exactly, you set up for yeah, your campaign. Yeah. yeah, no, it's uh, it's hung uh, hung cow for Congress dot, uh, dot com. So it's h u n g c a o uh, for, for Congress dot com, and you know we we run a grassroots um, basically campaign, and, and a lot of our donors are less than a hundred dollars. I mean, it's yeah. just we we've got over I think close to ten thousand donors at this point. It's just it's all grassroots. It's you know I'm, I know times are hard for everybody. So, you know, we're, we're asking, hey, five, ten dollars, whatever you can afford. But if you want your voice heard, no matter where you live in the U.S., I mean, we have we have donors from all 50 states, including the District of uh, Columbia. And uh, you found you know, a District and, of Columbia Republican to donate. Yes, to. Yes, exactly. But I, I, I I'm sad to say AOC's abuela didn't give me anything. So I have nothing from Puerto Rico. Okay. So, so well, we always have something to shoot. for. Yeah, I know. So uh, but um Honestly, you know, we, we run a grassroots campaign, so if we, you know, we honor any any amount of money that, that people can give because our voice, no matter where you live, our vote's going to help change the course of this country. Yeah, well, you're a hell of a guy who's got an incredible story, and your family must be so proud of what you've accomplished and what your whole family's accomplished, really. I mean, it's a uniquely American story. But you're not going to get out of here without answering these three Uh-oh, questions. Okay, all right? stand by. I'm sitting at the edge of my seat right yeah, now. Yeah, this is the stuff that matters here, Hung. This is serious. Uh, so if you can plan your last meal on earth, what would it be? 
pho. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm Vietnamese. I love pho. I mean, it's, it's great. It's, it's, uh, that's, that was, that's what makes champions, right? That's, the pho. That's Have you, it. I got to take you, take a, no, it's not pho. Okay, it's pho. <laughs> It's it's fun. <laughs> right. Okay. All right. So I ha- I've done a little Vietnamese food, uh, and I'm pretty sure I've had pho. Okay. But but then uh, I got to take you out one day. Make sure you get some real. You've pho. got. I'm sure yeah. you got the the hot spots for that. Well, you know, uh, Seven Corners, the, the Eden Center. That's like yeah. little Vietnam right there. We'll, we'll, we'll meet there one day. And, that's and your have spot. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Good. 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 So <clears throat> let's do this for you for the second question because it's a little. You're just getting into politics. Usually, I ask people if you never got into politics, what would you be doing? But like that was like what six months for you go yeah, for exactly. you so so yeah. let's back it up a little bit. Let's say you never got into the military, right? And you have this blue sky openness of something to do with your life, given your background, your motivation for service. What do you think you'd do to fill it? Is there any sort of ambition that you had out? And this can be really blue sky because like Ted Cruz said he'd play in the <laughs> NBA, which you know I mean come on. <laughs> no, I mean. Uh- the military was my dream. I mean, it's still my dream job. I wish you know I could stay in, but I needed to fight for our uh, soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, and coast guardsmen from a different uh, perspective. So that was my dream job. But if not, I would love to go in law enforcement. You know, I've I've supported the FBI's Joint Terrorism Task Force for many years. I've worked with you know uh, police and sheriff's departments across the country. I stood up a bomb squad in Monterey. Wow. I worked with San Diego Sheriff's Department and then uh, Virginia Beach Police Department bomb squad. And now, I mean, I'm working hand in hand with our sheriff, uh, Mike Chapman. He's just one of the, you know, just amazing American. And then, uh, and Sheriff Hill down in Prince William, and Sheriff Falls, and and Connie in Rappahannock. I mean, they're they're just great Americans. And and you know, I always tell police officers and law enforcement officers that you know, I fight the away games and you fight the home games, and that's that's what they do. And so that's that that would be a great way to put it that's a great way to put it plus you know an answer like that and given his background i mean this is if you ever got stuck in a tough place this is the guy you call right i mean (laughs) i've got my rape whistle i'm fine (laughs) (laughs) something tells me nobody's gonna be coming for you (laughs) um all right so here's the final question this is a little esoteric this gets a you know sort of what goes to motivate you right and the, the question is what motivates you more, the thrill of victory or the agony of defeat? But let me explain what that means. Okay. Our view is that everybody is motivated by one of these two things because the, the thrill of victory people are people who are sort of sunny optimists, always charging up the hill. They are just trying to get to the next accomplishment, get the next thing done. That's what motivates them, right? The agony of defeat people, every accomplishment they've ever had in life lasts about two seconds. They enjoy it for like two seconds. Every defeat or setback that they've ever had, they wear like a backpack and it motivates them to try to either never repeat those mistakes or make sure that those mistakes aren't even tried on them at any point in the future, right? And it's two very different motivations. We've had probably like a 50-50 split on the program on on who identifies with which. which. Hung. Where do you find yourself? Goodness, that's a hard question. I mean, anybody who says it's not whether you win or lose never, obviously, never won. But, <laughs> <laughs> yes. But, I mean, I, I love, I love victories. I love, but you know, being from an Asian mindset, you know, your parents let you uh, enjoy that for two minutes, and you keep going to the next next uh, accomplishment. Yeah. And and any you turn any defeat into to victory. So I, I guess I would say the the, the thrill of victory. I mean, I I want to, I, I always want to you know, achieve more and, and, and get more. And, and cause unfortunately with, with, uh, overbearing parents, well, they're not overbearing, but people, <laughs> I know what you parents mean. who, who keep pushing you, you, you get, you get to enjoy those victories for two minutes and then you, you go on to the next, uh, on next, to the next. Let me, let me ask you this way. Uh, your greatest achievement, more memorable than your worst defeat. Oh gosh. Okay. So yeah, my, my worst defeat does stick out more. Um, You're in agony of defeat. Guy. Okay, sorry. So, just, so this is I, like I, I knew it. I knew it the moment you sat down. But I, I, it's a hard question to like sort of frame up right. But I think we got there. Okay, thank you. I think we got sorry, there. Yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah. Sorry, ESL, right? English is a second language. I didn't. No, okay. <laughs> no, no God. I, I didn't understand. Uh, you know, but you're, you're right. Maybe it is because that drives me more than anything. That's just like you know, you, you, you look at. Um, some of the things that you, you failed and you're like, okay, I'm not, I'm going to keep. I'm never going to do that again. Yeah. And I'm going to work 
10 times harder to make sure I'm not even in that position again. Yes. Right? Yes. Yeah, you're that guy. Okay. I could see that a mile away. <laughs> Listen, Hunk Cow, I can't thank you enough for coming in here and sharing your story. We're going to be totally behind you on the Variety Program, and you really got to get to Congress. You're going to be a star once you're there. You're there for all the right reasons. Thank you for our service, your service to our nation and everything that you've done. Thanks for coming. No, thank you so much.